Hello everybody and welcome back to LMM and as you can probably tell I'm at a railway so that means it must be time for Lorry Goes Loco. If you're enjoying what you're seeing on the channel at the moment then how about having a look at some of our social media that's coming up on the screen now including things like our Discord where you can chat to me and the rest of the team and other like-minded people about well trains and other things that we like to show on the channel and of course there is there also the link to our Patreon if you'd want to help us out and help support the channel and allow us to do more of things like this. Today we've come back to the Middleton Railway. Yes, they've asked us back, which is really quite wonderful. And boy guys, do we have a treat for you. Come to Yorkshire, they said. Sunny Yorkshire. It is, frankly, a grim and miserable day. <laughs> and uh, for the life of me, I don't know why we haven't stayed in the shed rather than getting, as you can see, rather damp out here. But we have a very special engine to drive today, which is this, Matthew Murray, which is a Manning Wardle L-Class. And there are precisely two L-Classes left in existence in the world. And funnily enough, both of them are here at the Middleton Railway. We have this one, which is number 1601 of 1903. She is an old girl. And then Sir Berkeley being the other one, which is actually slightly older than this one, even still, I think by like 30 years. Oh, don't quote me on that, but Sir Berkeley is significantly older. And isn't it beautiful? This is one of the very stereotypical steam engines. You think steam engine in your head, and this is the kind of thing that comes to mind. If it's not bright blue, like a certain famous tank engine. It's this kind of thing. This screams stereotypical steam engine. And for me personally, it's something that I respond to very well because it reminds me of Whissington, which is obviously it's a Hartwell Clark, but it's very similar. This is like the next stage up from a totally different company, but it's a very similar design and they share, well, a lot of similarities. There seems to be a direct link between the two. Now this is what could well be called a contractor's locomotive. Now, if we go back far enough before the time when there were diggers and tractors and lorries and dumper trucks, and if you were going to do a big building project, you needed a locomotive and you needed a railway. Building a housing estate, you put the railway down and that's what moved everything. You had a factory, you put the railway down and that's what moved everything. This is a contractor's locomotive. It's the kind of thing that would be bought and then transported, move everything around, and then when the job was finished, move on to another place. And to be fair, that's exactly what happened with this. She was sold to P&W Anderson Company to help build the Kent Portland Cement Works. And it was precisely what they used the locomotive for. But unusually, rather than keeping the locomotive and carrying on with use and using it for further projects, they immediately sold the locomotive to the nuclearly constructed works. And that's where it spent its entire working life. It was during this time that the locomotive picked up the name Arthur, something that it would carry for many more years. I mean, his career finished in 1967 when it was purchased by the Industrial Locomotives Preservation Society who took the thing and had it at the Kent and East Sussex Railway where it became their number 17. And it enjoyed use on the Kent and East Sussex Railway for a number of years, although by the mid-1970s it was stored out of use. The railway had enough other engines to go around and this one didn't seem to be in favour. It changed hands again, moving this time to peak rail where it was used mostly around the yard i don't know if it actually ran any trains there all the records seem to refer to it as a yards engine but it was used there for a few years the locomotive had repairs done to it at the berkson works on peak rail but again nothing really seemed to happen to it and then it changed hands again this time in 1990 being sold to the middleton railway and coming here and it filled an important gap in their collection of leeds built engines However, by the time it got here, it was still not in particularly good condition and it took an awful amount of work to bring it back into the condition you see behind me. Some of the notable things it has had include having a brand new boiler fitted to it because the old one was shot and basically every single component down there having to receive some major work or to be completely renewed. She's had a lot of work and the railway, the railway should be very proud of what they've achieved bringing it back into this state here. On return to traffic, the locomotive was renamed Matthew Murray, and it's now the fourth locomotive as part of the Middleton Railway to carry the name. It's a tradition here that one locomotive will always have the name of one of the pioneers of, well, railways, well, railways engines here. 
So it's a long held tradition and it's a lovely little touch to really make the locomotive feel like it's theirs. And something I really like about it. This little lump weighs just over 20 tonnes and has a boiler pressure of about 140 psi. So this combined with her 12 by 18 inch cylinders give her a traction effort of about eight and a half thousand pounds, which for a small engine isn't actually too shabby. It is just lovely having a Leeds built engine back here working so close to its home. It's got a, makes it much more special than having it anywhere else and it suits the surroundings here remarkably well. Clearly the locomotive was never designed to do long distance. It's always been built as a short light railway or shunting locomotive. For instance, the bunker holds just under a ton of coal. And the tanks, well, they hold some litres of water. We're not quite sure on that one, but it's quite tall. The actual in terms of width, down here, it's only that wide. It's, it's a deceptive tank. It doesn't actually hold as much water as you might think. Now, continuing the British tradition of having all the motion inside is wonderful. It gives this a lovely, clean looking outside. However, it does make preparation a lot more difficult because you have to get inside it. And it's one thing that seems to be very typical of British locomotives. Let's throw all the motion inside. I mean, it's a Victorian thing. It started like that and why change what works? It clearly is a good design because they kept making locomotives and people kept buying them and it's still here today. And you know, I, obviously I understand it's had a lot of work, but it's still working today. So why change a good design, right? Now, it's one of those things that makes you really appreciate how much technology has come on and how much nicer modern locomotives are. For instance, out here in the pouring wet, getting very wet, mainly heat from it, you really do appreciate how nice a modern locomotive is in comparison. They can just walk around quickly and go sorted rather than imagine the guys back in the day. It's a day like this, it's coming down. You've got to come here, you've got to get this thing ready. You've got to clamber in there, in the wet, in the muck. And I love steam engines. You guys know I absolutely adore steam engines. And even I concede at this point, diesels and electric locomotives, this, that was the way forward. Because this is lovely for a day or two, but even I would, I'd be getting to the end of my tether doing this every day in this kind of weather going, well, I'll oil the thing up. I've got a clamber underneath it in this. Not to say that it's not a wonderful thing. I mean, nothing can possibly ever take that away that this is just a glorious piece of art. Like, take away all of that its ability to do something, the fact that it is a genuinely useful thing. This is a beautiful, beautiful piece of design work, isn't it? All the curves on it, every single piece of it is just beautiful. It's an absolutely gorgeous piece of work. And we don't make things that look like this anymore. I mean, obviously we don't make steam engines anymore with the exception of new builds and blah, blah, blah. But just the way we went about things, that everything is so beautifully placed and worked out for it to just make a statement like this. And we don't do that anymore. Everything's like plastic and boring. And this, this is proper. And I like that. There are lots of really nice little quirky features on this engine. But my favorite is this here, where at some point, the nice rounded edge of the sander box has been smashed. Presumably the smoke box door swung open. And so it's just got this piece of plate welded on here that you can just see how it's got a straight edge here. And it's just lovely little parts of this that help tell its story. Also really like this, the general shape of this, like the low slung smoke box door. Uh, the slightly raised buffers, it all really helps kind of this kind of diminutive and cute factor this engine's got going on. The fact that the buffers end here, but the frames themselves are down at, well, down at that height. It's, it just makes it cute. It makes it seem smaller and it, it gives it kind of like a spunky kind of spirit to it. You kind of like, yeah, it's, it looks like it's gonna, it looks, well, I hate myself for saying this, like a really useful engine. And I'll be honest with you guys, I'm getting absolutely soaked here. And so we're gonna, we're gonna go back in time to before we pulled this out this morning to when we arrived and have a look at how to prep it. And we're gonna go have a look in the cab as we did first thing this morning. So if you're watching this, this means that we successfully traveled back in time to this morning when the locomotive was sat inside the shed cold, as are we because it's, it's still dark out there. But we're here now to start doing the prep that we need to do to bring one of these into life. So stage one is to hop up onto the footplate. And with any steam engine, there are five checks you should do to start off with. Number one is make sure the handbrake is on. Number two, make sure the regulator is shut. And the reverser that's over this side is in mid gear. Doing these checks means that if you do get any steam up, it can't move, it can't suddenly roll into life. We also make sure that the cylinder cocks here are open. And then finally, we have a look here. 
at the water gauge to make sure we've got water. Now, at the moment, it seems like we've got half a boiler full of water, but we'll isolate that one, or we'll isolate that one. All right, clear underneath. People don't like it if they're underneath. And then we'll open up the drain, open up the top one so it doesn't airlock. And now we shall shut the drain and open up the bottom. And as water's come back in, we know that there is indeed water in the boiler, so that means it is safe to light up. Next, open up the box. We have a quick look inside the firebox. And we make sure to uh, have a look and see what's in the box and have a look at the tubes. And of course, at the top, looking for the fusical plug. Satisfied? We need to have a look at the smoke box. Oh, this is gonna be awkward because it's in that funny position. Undo that, open up that. And again, have a gander in here, making sure that it is indeed clean, which is good. And that the tubes all look in good condition and we're not seeing any seepage, any water, or anything else that looks concerning. So that's a good start. With that, we can shut that back up, making sure we get a good seal by tightening it up. And then next, I can go underneath and just do a casual glance, everything under here, particularly the firebox, and make sure there's no seepage anywhere under this, and also have a gander in the ash pan and see the foundation ring. And with that, we're satisfied, and that means we can make some fire. Oh, this is good rotten old sleep. And we're aiming to build a ring around the outside of the firebox, which now means it's time to add the wood, which is an art form of each piece being carefully placed, time taken to ascertain where each one should go. In seriousness, what we're doing is aiming to have the whole grate covered. With that, next stage is to take some of these nice rags we have, which have been pre-soaked with powder fin and this lighter that's handily up here. And like that, away we go. Now, the plan is to use these rags, then use another one, light it off the first rag, like so, and then place it elsewhere, and then repeat. And now we shut the fire hole door because it's quite smoky. And so we'll let that burn through and get itself going and then we can add some more wood and then move on to coal. And while that does that, it's time to have a look at everything else that needs oiling up. With the fire lit and seemingly burning well, the next stage is to start doing the lubrication. And there seems to be a reoccurring theme now on Laurie Ghost Loco of doing inside motion 060s because I've got all of this to do and then once again I've got to clamber inside and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with inside motion 060s because I really like them and they are meant to ride a lot better than outside motion but I am now getting a little bit sick and tired of having to clamber in every single time but I guess you guys like me uh, struggling so let's start off first off over here and oil up on the motion like that put that in like so. Then we have the brake hanger here. And it's just a matter of putting a little bit of oil across the top there. Then repeat the process again here. Whoops. And into the little divot there. Now, what I've done there is over oiled it slightly to help protect it from future rust and grime. Again, a bit of oil. And again, move along and drop a bit more oil into this one. Now, what's amusing is the front ones haven't used as much oil as the rear ones. And that's obviously because the rear ones are sat next to the firebox and so the temperature is warmer and so the oil goes more runny and thus gets used up more quickly. And now, squirty squirty there, and squirty squirty there, just on the hangers. Now we can start working our way back this way. Here we have the mechanical lubricator, which is going to run the cylinders. So we just grab the steam oil, which is cleverly labelled steam oil, and we can pull that. I want to twist that a bit more, that's a very awkward size. And we can just put a bit of steam oil in there. And we can move on to this. Now this is the lubricator which feeds all the action boxes. We've got all these 
nice lines coming off here that head off to our axle boxes. Put in here, which helpfully says lube, and chuck some oil into there and just fill it up nicely, like so. So that's pretty simple. It's quite nice for a locomotive to have the added extra things like axle box lubricators because it saves a lot of mucking around. So next, I've got to get up to there. Now this is quite simple. Make sure it's turned off, like so. Take the lid off it, like so. We can open up the drain, and make sure any water is, we assume all the water has gone. And now we can just fill it back up with some oil. Over on this side, there's a couple more things we need to do. There is a little divot here on the reverser. It's so just a little drop of, oh, this is nice and controlled, isn't it? A little drop of oil there to feed that. There's a much bigger hole there on the reverser linkage. And I have one of those to do on the other side, which I need to reach around and get to. Obviously, I need to do the motion on this side as well, but well, we've done it one side, so we'll repeat that later off camera. You don't need to be shown by that. Then the panger themselves just get a little bit of oil through there and across there, and the same on that side. We can oil the top of the expansion links like that, like that, like that, and across like that. That also means I can get to the top of that one like that. I must be able to lift. There we go. That's the other pot there. Now I need to get, so there's a pot there on top of the slide bar and there's, on the little end, there's a little cork. So we can put the oil in there to the little end and we're just going to dribble that from height and hope for the best, like that. Perfect. And that's the little end. <clears throat> then the slide bar lubricators there. The only other thing I've got to do on this side, if I can reach it, is to squeeze the oil can through the, the gap stuff, lift the pot there, and chuck a bit of oil in here. Now this is the oil, the lubricator that lubricates the valve spindles. So that's basically all the lubrication on the outside completed. All I need to do now is do that spring, and then we need to go inside. I'm pleased to say there is a pit here at the railway, so it makes it going under a lot easier. Now, having got assurance that nobody's going to attempt to move it and the handbrake is indeed on, it's safe to go underneath the loco, which is always good fun. Round the coupling hook and then keep the head down. Oh, somebody's dribbled in my ear! Oh, that's so rude! Ooh, there we go. Now, what's quite nice about this is I don't need to straddle anything, so that's a, a positive start. Now, I'll we'll start here with the big end. And using my nice new friend, the squeezy oil can, we'll fill up the big end like this. And then we've got our eccentric straps here, and there's four of these behind me on my back. It's basically resting up against the firebox. And so it's quite warm doing this. This is the job for a winter's morning, as at time of filming it is, because it's, it's like having central heating. It's like having your back up against a radiator. Only when it gets too hot, I can't really move away from it because I've got the eccentrics in the way. And these drink a surprisingly large amount of oil. There we go, that's that. It's very important with this as well, not to drop the corks. People take a very dim view on dropping corks and getting them all grubby and nasty. And so one fill of these will basically do a day's worth of running, especially what we have to do today and with the length of the railway here. Oh, that's uh, slightly overfilled, but that's just going to help lubricate the axle, which is definitely a thing now. And I've got a big end to do here, like so. And that will hopefully conclude oiling up on the rear axle. Now I've got to try and get myself in at the front, which is going to be... Okay. Through we go. And we've got various things here to do. So we've got the die block itself has got a little divot in it there. So we give that some oil. Then in the bottom, there's a little bit of oil that needs to go into there. And the same, the other side there. And the die block itself 
there. Now I need to somehow get onto the top of that, so I'll twist myself in and a little bit of oil across there, across there. I think that concludes the inside oiling up. So that is the basic lubrication completed on one side. Obviously I need to finish doing this and I need to repeat the oil pots I can't reach, particularly on the sliders and the little end on the other side, but basically repeat the stuff I've already done. So it's not really any point in actually filming that for you guys because there's nothing to be gained. So that's it. All that remains now is to sit back, maintain the fire and wait for about three, three and a bit hours for it to actually get enough steam to move. And it's still absolutely horrible outside and we've got like three hours to kill while she builds up on steam. I figured the best thing we could do is have a look at the cab and talk to you about what all the controls in here are. So right straight in front of us here is the regulator, which is, if you're not sure, you're effectively throttle. And then tucked down on my side here is the reverser, for forward and backwards, dropping it over to there is forwards and bringing it all the way back there is reverse. Tucked in next door to that, we've got the cylinder cocks down there, and then next door to that, I've got the water feed for my for my injector tucked all the way down there. Now, confusingly, the injectors themselves are over here. Now, this tap here controls the CPU for my injector, and you may notice next door to it at some point they looks like they used to be a tap, and that's because yes, yes, there was. The valve itself broke, so now it's just that little green little tap there that runs the fireman side injector. Confusingly, the fireman side injector is that golden twist handle there, whereas the one on my side is a pullout, which is slightly confusing. There's obviously been a, a change of valve somewhere in its life. Look in here, we've got the whistle here, the steam brake here. This one is fitted on new for the vacuum, which is the gauge on the right hand side, and on the left hand side shows steam. So at the moment, yeah, we've got about 50 psi, so it is happily making steam. This one here is for the blower, and behind it we have a shutter for the whistle. Here we have the brake for the vacuum, which is actually quite a nice thing. That's different and quite nice. And then down in front of us we've got the standard things. We've got the gauge glasses with the isolator top and bottom and the drain. And, uh, one of the interesting things about the cab, you may have noticed, is the fact that I'm stood on the springs they come into the cab. Now, standing on it like this is quite good. However, there is a real risk on this of accidentally getting a foot underneath it and getting a toe caught as the locomotive goes over a bump. So one has to be a little bit careful of where one stands. Obviously, here is the handbrake. And then we have the other feature on this engine, which I have literally never seen before on any locomotive that I've been on. And I, I've lost track now, I'll be honest. I've lost track how many steam engines I've been on all, all over the world. The bunker here has two separate openings for it, and I've never seen this. So we've got this side and that side. Now, I don't understand why this is here. I mean, it gives you a bit more space to swing, but because the driver stood here, you will never, ever, ever fire it from this side because it's where the driver is. I mean, if you're single manning here, I suppose it makes sense for the driver to be able to go and chuck it in. But when it's double manning, and you're where the camera is, you will never, you won't ever use that. It's a very, very strange, and also I love this, this is one of my favourite things about the whole engine, is two bolts which have been ground to make the shovel hole up. I think that's absolutely superb. Other lovely things this has, and this engine is a gentleman sporting locomotive because it's got a hat stand on it, and that's very important. It's also got a nice handrail here where you can hang things like your jacket when it gets nice and wet. Other things that this engine has, which really mean it is ahead of its time, are air conditioning. For the moment, air conditioning is off, and now air conditioning is on. It's pretty cool. I do like special plates, and I'll just push that all the way through. We'll leave that like that. So, it's quite nice. Now, the only thing that I'm really lacking in here is definitely the feel of a seat. I mean, it's quite nice to be perched on the edge here. You feel when you're going along, you might like to see. It's also quite a long way to the forward window. There's the back head comes out a long way into the cab. And the only other thing I've been told is that the safety valve is right here. And if it does blow off, the shroud here tends to make a, a rattly noise, or kind of a, a, almost like a scream. It's apparently quite a, a unique and interesting noise for this locomotive. Apart from that, down by your feet, down there, there are two handles, one there, one here, and one here. 
and that's for the dampers. This engine is fitted with front and rear dampers, which is quite unusual for a small industrial to have both front and rear. Quite often, there's just a rear damper, and obviously that's how we open those to get to the S-Ram. Apart from that, it's lovely. Stood here, feeling the height of it, is about perfect. The regulator is set just about right, and the cab itself is high enough that you don't smash your head all the time. I mean, if you lean out, I'm banging my head there. And of course, the gaps of the cab are built so that you can't actually pass through them at this stage. You have to twist sideways to get out, which is, of course, a safety mechanism to stop you from falling out of it. And the other big thing to notice about this is, of course, the locomotive does have a brand new boiler. This one here should have a date on it of, there we go, 2001 it was built. Which is, for an engine that is, oh, that's almost, almost, 100 year younger boiler than the locomotive, which is really quite spectacular, isn't it? It feels, it feels proper up here. And frankly, I'm very excited to be able to get out and take this for a run and just see what it will do. Gently open up the regulator, release the brake, we should get a little bit of movement. <coughs> Whistle and there we have it. Gentle bit of a movement, which is quite glorious because it's a very, very stiff regulator on this. I wasn't expecting that, but the actual movement of it is lovely. Now we've got a bit of movement there, it feels absolutely superb. immediately something that kind of the feeling that grabs you of driving a locomotive this old that you're driving a piece of heritage and just how important that is and how amazing it is that this little thing has survived and the whistle sounds superb and that's a very important part of this so you look at the crossing as we're going crossing speed so that's a good start to your side to my side here we go then the first thing we come to is the tunnel so we can a quick look at everything make sure that Everything looks about right, we've got water. And aim for the tunnel. Then I'm gonna look back and watch for my train. Once we're out of the five mile an hour limit, we can actually do something. So lean forward, notch up a little bit. And we're out, which means whistle for the tunnel and wait for the world to go dark, but the noise to come. about this whole experience is driving steam on freight. It's a rare opportunity to actually get a steam engine out on a good service. And really, I am loving it. To have a little industrial locomotive built around here, working on a freight train up this line, 
Honestly, I could be back in the day. It feels so unbelievably proper. It's just magnificent. I think she sounds magnificent. It's got such a wonderful bath on it. And we're really actually having to work it. I'm driving it a bit on the reversal, which is absolutely superb. So, I mean, the first thing I think we'll try now is we're going to stop that and just drop the brake and see what will happen if we... Which we don't have to stop quickly. That was quite impressive. So let's see if she'll pick it up again. Now, it is wet out here. So asking her to do a hill start in the wet, what a super little thing. It's a relatively heavy train, she's only little, and we've pulled away with that. I did not expect that. I was expecting to have to fight to get her to hurry that. But no, she's far more sore footed than you'd think. Brilliant. The cab's quite long, and I can see mostly just the edge of the tank, and it has to be head out to really see what's going on. But really, this is such a sensation, and she's such a pretty looking little thing. And because the size of the cab comes here, it's no bother to stick my head out to really appreciate what's going on, or to look back and just appreciate the sheer length of the good strength, which is pretty good. And now we're going to open her up a little bit more and just feel it as we storm up the line. I, it is a good sounding little engine. We're coming through quite nice. And for a fixed coupled engine, there are a couple of things. You can feel the track a lot more on this. If you've got a used to a fairly good way, but definitely slightly rough. You may also be able to hear that the reverser. Reverse the raffle. There's something in the linkage there that does make a bit of noise. which I don't have. My fireman's got a seat that side, but there isn't one for me. And that would be nice, but that's all. I can perch myself quite happily here and still look forward. It's just such a sensation. And I'll tell you one thing, with the train we've got behind us, she's keeping speed well. My fireman is busy, but she's working well up. And you might think maybe she's a little little for this kind of train, not this kind of gradient. It's 140 in places. But no, just happy. Just does what she's asked. Regulators. 
to go. No, it's a bit stiff, and I'll, I'll accept it's stiff. The beard is fantastic, now it's open. And you can really put that powder a little bit, and a little bit, you can hear the difference in the exhaust. You can make our way up. Now, she may not be the most refined engine I've ever been on. Certainly, there's some stuff on here that's banging and crashing quite away, but, but what a thing! There is such a sensation of being on a steam locomotive, and this one has such an amazing character. You really feel like you're with her, forging her way through. And that dark, and also because it is such an old engine here, going from 19, uh, 1919, no, 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 you really do kind of appreciate what things were like at the turn of the century when this was the cutting edge and how far we've come with everything else. Now, yes, certainly, the link it up is slightly interesting. The reverser rattles to it, and the safety valves from Nagar make a horrible noise. But in terms of sensation, this is absolutely fantastic. It's just a really nice little engine, a good all-rounder. And for what they do here at Middleton, it's absolutely superb. It does all their needs very easily indeed. It works their three coach passenger quite happily. It all do this little demo good. It's absolutely 100% perfectly suited to the line. They have a very good engine and they should be proud of it as well. It's a real, real showpiece. Everybody loves it. It's just well liked by the crews. It steams amazingly. It drives nice. I really like it. It's something, the kind of side engine that I would truly love to own. You know, you'd like one of these. I would love one of these. It's so good here. It's just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And as we come to the other end of the line, I genuinely don't know if there's anything else but I would enjoy it more. Because that was just magnificent, storming up a bank with a freight. That's a bucket list thing ticked off right there. That was absolutely magnificent. We've arrived here back at Park Holt in this typically wet, miserable and dingy Yorkshire day. It marks the end of this video and I really hope that you've enjoyed seeing us take out Matthew Murray. What an absolutely superb engine. It, I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I really can't stress how good it was and the opportunity to take a steam engine up basically an industrial line with a freight train has been just one of the single best experiences I've ever had. It's fantastic. It's definitely ticked one of my bucket list items way off. And so with that, thank you very much for watching, guys. If you have enjoyed this and you've enjoyed what you've seen and you want to know more about the Middleton Railway, then there's a link to their website in the description. And if you really like what you've seen and you think, I'd like to be part of that or maybe learn how to drive Matthew Murray, then there's also a link to the Contact Us form where you can get in contact and ask about volunteering and become part of the railway. And also there's a link to their Facebook page. Drop a message. They're lovely people and very friendly. And if maybe you think, I really want to help this railway and help LMM out, then how about looking at the Rise of the Phoenix campaign they've got, which is to try and help Olive, which is a, well, an inspection vehicle which tragically a few years ago suffered an arson attack and was, well, gutted. The railway started putting it back together and got the cosmetics back, but the inside still needs a lot of time and a lot of money. So if you would consider having a look at the campaign, maybe helping them out, that would mean a great deal to me and it would make a super deal to the railway. In the meantime, guys, thank you very much for watching. 
let us know in the comments what do you think about this have you been to the Middleton Railway do you like it let us know with that I'm going home and oh give the video a like subscribe if you haven't and we'll see you next time oh and if you have enjoyed this video how about clicking over there for the last locomotive I drove here at the Middleton Railway Sweet Pea or perhaps down there for the austerity I drove in Belgium thanks guys we'll see you next time